All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started here with uh, module four. Um, so this module, we're gonna talk about static settlement, deformation, and cracking. Uh, some of the objectives here um, is to uh, be able to define, estimate total sediment for embankment dams. We're gonna, we're gonna look at different types of settlement, um, go through the whole foundation consolidation process, um, describe how to use and how to actually define what camber you put on your dam. Camber, for just who anybody doesn't know, is where you actually overbuild the embankment by a few feet or whatever you think your settlement's going to be so that when it does settle, you're maintaining that your dam crest elevation. Uh, and then we'll look at a couple other uh, design measures that you can use. Um, so settlement, I put this on here particularly to antagonize my geotech friends, but an embankment dam is not just a style ah, static pile of dirt. And it's not dirt, it's soil or rock fill or earth fill material. Uh, it sits there. So essentially, you don't just build this, this embankment and then not expect it to have some sort of movement. Um, what you're hoping to, for, though, is that the movements are not over what you've designed for or you don't have too much differential settlement. We'll get quite into details on differential settlement because that causes cracking and can lead to some different PFMs that... Many of you who've done risk assessments on dams know that that's a big issue for a lot of our um, concentrated leak erosion PFMs. Um, what we want to do during the design process, like I said, is be able to anticipate what the settlement's going to be and then put some measures in there that we can use so that hopefully long term the dam will be at the elevation that we want it to be. Uh, definition of settlements, change in elevation of reference plane or point, typically due to an increased load. Um, at the dam foundation contact, obviously that's a critical portion of your dam. Um, we're going to get uh, excess, you know, poor pressure dissipation over time. We're probably going to get some settlement. You could end up with some cracking at that elevation. Could issue have issues with piping, so we want to make sure we have good filters in place to defend against that. Um, within the embankment, you actually get some compression as well. If you if you actually counted the number of lifts that you had to do to build your embankment, you'd actually find that you need more than theoretically you'd need to because you're going to get some settlement down at the base of the embankment uh, if you don't account for that. Um, and then on the surface of the embankment, obviously, uh, if, you're, if you don't build in that camber and that extra material, you're going to be lower than you expected it to be. So just a quick little kind of background for settlement, it's three parts. You've got the sort of immediate or elastic settlement. You've got primary consolidation settlement, typically for uh, fine grain materials. And then you've got secondary settlement and compression as well. And we'll go through each one of those, step through each one. So immediate settlement's probably the easiest one to think about. You apply a load, material compresses elastically. Um, for coarse grain soils, this is gonna happen pretty quickly. Uh, typically it's gonna be done, it's gonna happen during the the uh, construction process. So it's not even something you're probably going to notice long term. Uh, fine grain materials also fairly quickly. Usually it's really mostly consolidation settlement that's going to take place after this that you're going to see after construction. Um, and soft and poor rock. This is another one I'll probably hit on this quite a bit. Um, people see bedrock, they think, oh, it's solid, but a lot of sedimentary units, claystone, siltstone, sandstones, you're actually going to see um, more settlement than you probably would expect from a rock material. Primary consolidation settlement, this is the one we're going to hit on a lot because particularly for fine grain soils, this is going to be the big, um, the, your big driver of settlement for in your foundation particularly. Um, so I always try to think of consolidation settlement as a sponge. So if you have a sponge and it's filled with water and you load it, you compress it, the water comes out of the sponge, the sponge gets smaller. Um, it's kind of the same thing with clay. Um, in sands, this happens very quickly. The water can dissipate very quickly because they're, they'll have, um, high uh, coefficient uh, hydraulic coefficients. Um, whereas in clays, it, it happens a lot slower because that water's got to work itself out of the clay material and usually into a coarse grain material to actually dissipate. So foundation consolidation, um, like, like I just said, um, that water's got to work its way out of that material. Um, typically, the way that we're going to uh, analyze this is by running a one-dimensional consolidation test, sometimes called an odometer test. Um, these should be formed on any material you get, you see in the foundation that you're going to expect the consolidation in. Um, a lot of times you can, materials that you expect to consolidate considerably, you can actually, if you can, in reality, remove them from the foundation, that's best. But a lot of times they can be too thick and you're going to have some material that's still underneath there. Or again, this could be 
a mudstone, claystone, siltstone, or a sandstone that has you know thick clay seams in it that you, you do have to account for the consolidation of those rock materials as well. Uh, here's just a picture, that same picture from the last module showing the consolidation test apparatus. I think if I click one more time, it goes away, yep. Um, typically we want, and I use the term undisturbed, sorry, Cassie, um, but we want Shelby tube um, samples to run for the odometer test. Uh, as least amount of disturbance as we can get for these samples, because sample disturbance actually affects these results considerably. Um, so again, try to do your best to get the best sample that you can get um, in the field for the testing. Um, you can see the uh, consolidation curves here. I think I've got this work. I got this working now on this one. Um, so you come in here. It's sort of recompressing the material to the stress it's seen before. Once it starts to peak right here, this peak at that corner, that's sort of where it's showing that the, the material has seen this load previously, call that pre-consolidation pressure. And then down here, we go into what's called virgin compression, where this is the first time that material is seeing this load. And then typically in the test, we'll run it back, unload it, and then reload it again so we can get this recompression curve. Uh, this is particularly important for over-consolidated materials where we're not actually going into the virgin compression, but we're looking at sort of this recompression of the material. Um, and I want to point out on this one, this field uh, virgin consolidation curve as well. This is important. This is more of a theoretical curve based on to try to take out sample disturbance. If you if you use the lab curve, you might underestimate, Greg, your C-sub-C value. Yeah, that's right. So you want to make sure that you use your that field curve so you kind of take that sample disturbance out of the out of the equation. Um, this is just a, a, a range of typical uh, C sub C values um, and C sub R values. The reason I put this up here and the reason we included it is because when you run these tests, you want to just kind of, again, sample disturbance can affect these significantly. So you want to make sure that you go back and you kind of check and make sure you're within the range. Um, of the, I mean, it doesn't have to be within the range, but you want to make sure you don't, something didn't go wrong during the test and you got something that's way out of left field. And another way to combat this is, again, just to take more samples and do more testing and see if there's any outliers or if there's any issues. Um, this C sub C value is the time rate of consolidation. Um, th this can be, I wouldn't say we don't use this in dams a lot, but I'd say it's more for, I've seen it used in other embankments where you have to preload a foundation in order to consolidate that material, because if you construct an embankment too quickly, you can actually increase significantly increase your excess pore water pressures and have issues. It's for anybody who's familiar with the Leaning Tower of Pisa, the reason it's not the tower that fell over is because they constructed it in stages. So they constructed it, they allowed the pore pressures to dissipate, they constructed another section, allowed the pore pressures to dissipate, and then that's why it just leaned instead of completely falling over. It's the same thing with embankments. So sometimes, not as typical in dam construction, but sometimes you'll have to use wick drains to uh, induce that consolidation to allow that those pore pressures to get out quicker. Um, and this is just a, a graph showing sort of a relationship between liquid limit and the time rate for C sub V. Um, so this is straight out of design standard number 13. This is uh, for camber design and we're gonna be using, this is what we're gonna be using for the exercise, these equations for normally consolidated material and over consolidated material. Um, so for the exercise, I'm going to give you all the values that you should need to go in this equation, and then we're going to calculate how much consolidation we have in our foundation and add that to our embankment settlement to come up with how much camber that we need. Question? Sorry? Yep. Go ahead. This one? Yep. Sorry. Let me see if I can get back. This testing, one. Testing. Um... Yeah, you're alluding to uh, stage construction, uh -huh. or, you know, not or avoiding developing those excess pore water pressures. Yep. Uh, is it also an advantage uh, for the sake of avoiding embankment cracking to try to also do a stage construction to avoid or try to um, achieve most of your anticipated settlement during construction as opposed to after? Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Yeah. No. Ideally. Most of your you want most of your settlement construction to, or sorry to happen during construction. Again, you can you can build things into it. The the further it comes after construction, the worse 
the worse off it is, right? Because you're not out there, you're not able to deal with it at that point, right? So you want to be able to build it in. So if it happens during, before or during construction, then you can add additional camber, um, make sure you're at the elevation that you want to be at uh, and not have it occur after construction. So, yes. And what is kind of a rule of thumb of when you're splitting that consolidation, you know, let's say you're trying to get to 90 or 95%, what, what is that percentage during construction versus what's tolerable after the end of construction? Is there like a rule of thumb or does it just come down to? It comes down, I mean, it's gonna be different for every, right, every exactly. dam and every foundation. So um, I don't know of a great rule of thumb, but again, I think as long as you anticipate for it and you've built it into your design and you've built defensive measures against it, I, it, it, it shouldn't matter in theory. But again, you want to try to limit how much post-construction settlement you have as much as possible. It's, it's, it's unavoidable. You're going to get some. Right, exactly. Right. But as long as you've estimated it properly, you've done your work during your design, you put in your design measures, you should be covered for it. Okay. It's so, kind of build in some insurance policies, basically. Exactly. Okay. Yep. Cool. Thank exactly. You. Any other questions? Okay. Um, yep. So we're going to go through this, like I said, in quite a bit of detail as part of the exercise. Um, this is also a table from that design standard number 13. Um, one thing I did want to point out, so this is just kind of showing you the different um, calculations that are used for to estimate foundation settlement. And you can see it's broken up here by station. So it's done all the way across the dam. And some dams, we only have one soil layer that we're looking at. In other ones, we have two different soil layers that are going to have different properties that we have to estimate, both of which. Uh, one thing I want to point out, and you actually just alluded to it, is that there's a step that I've taken out of the exercise, which is this this estimates the total settlement here, and then the portion of which which they anticipate after construction. I took that out of the exercise to simplify it. I try to make it so we can actually do it in time. So what we're going to do is we're going to assume that our total settlement is going to be all post-construction, which normally you wouldn't do, but again, I did it just to simplify things for the exercise. Um, secondary consolidation. So this is when you get, when you continue to get uh, consolidation, even though the load hasn't changed. And typically materials that exhibit this kind of behavior, silts and peats and soft clays, you're gonna wanna get out of your foundation if you can. <laughs> um, if this is a big problem for your dam, you're probably not on a great dam site. Um, so again, if you see this in your testing where you've got significant, significant secondary consolidation, uh, consider removal of that material, or at least removal to an appropriate depth where the load isn't going to cause that secondary consolidation. Um, the reason consolidation is an issue, obviously, like I mentioned, loss of freeboard, you want your dam elevation to be what your design dam elevation is going to be. If it drops down, you are now got a higher increase of um, overtopping potential. Um, instrument cable rupture, so this is an inter interesting one, right? If you string cables internal to your embankment, say for a piezometer, and it's stretched to near its maximum, and then you've got settlement of your embankment, you can actually rupture that cable. So um, sometimes they'll actually build in where they'll actually wrap the cable a bunch of times in plan directions that allows for that movement. Or again, if, you, if you're anticipating large settlements, you're gonna have to do something to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, and this is another one we'll talk about quite a bit, closure section differential settlement. Again, anybody who's worked on a risk assessment knows when they've had to stop construction and they'll leave an embankment slope open for a period of time and then come back and then construct in a closure section in there. That, um, that area along that embankment is susceptible to differential settlement and where you can get cracking and you can get potential failure modes showing up. Um, loss of freeboard on spillway training walls is interesting. So again, it's all about things being built to the elevations you want them to be at. If you have a certain spillway elevation where water can overtop during your maximum flood, but then you get some sort of settlement, now you have a dip in your wall, now water can come over that wall and start eroding your embankment. So things you gotta think about with foundation consolidation issues. Um, and mostly we've been talking about sort of longitudinal effects along the embankment but we have to think about transverse effects as well. So upstream to downstream as well and how that how the consolidation is gonna affect our embankment in that direction. Um, and like I said, for risk assessments, embankment cracking is a big one. Differential settlement's a big one. So what, you, what you're looking at here on this sort of, this is a profile cut across the embankment. You've got your sort of bedrock, hard bedrock material here in the middle, but you've got soft material on either side of that that was left in the foundation. 
And right at the transition between those, there's a good chance you're going to get some differential settlement across there because this portion of the embankment is going to settle quite a bit more than this portion of the embankment. And it's something to look at for new dam designs, how you can um, mitigate that. Like I said, ideally, you'd remove all this soft material out. Um, or again, you just you design some, maybe you'd make your filters a little bit thicker, your drains a little bit thicker, so that if that uh, differential settlement does occur, that you do have some um, float in there. And I'm going to pick on somebody at random. Adam, <laughs> can you tell me what the problem is when we have steep abutments, like shown in this figure right here? You're going to get more settlement in the center of the... You're talking about the figure on the bottom? The figure on the bottom right, yep. The, with the steep yeah, rock when you abutments. have those steep rock abutments, yep. you're going to have more settlement in the, the center, the steepest or the deepest portion of the embankment, which is going to cause you to, like you're showing there, form maybe some cracks on the upper parts of the embankment, but you could also have that arching action develop into a horizontal fracture. So I picked on Adam because Adam's done a ton of risk assessments and he's dealt with this a lot of times. So I... <laughs> I picked on him on purpose. That's exactly right. Yeah, so you got to look out for that. So one thing that we're going to do in this, I know uh, Ed's going to get into it quite a bit with his uh, foundation um, design module, is that a lot of times these, we need to shape these embankments. And the key is having not having anything too steep next to something too shallow, because again, you're going to get over a small area, you're going to get a big differential settlement. When that settlement occurs over a very small area, that's when you see these cracking. Or in this particular instance, you'll actually see arching across those two embankments. Are those two abutments? All it is. Um, so we also can have issues with uh, dry, low density foundations, uh, hydro collapse. This is typically in um, you know wind blown deposits, so typically siltier materials. Um, Greg mentioned earlier he had a he had a dam where they had a embankment material that was around I think it was eighty seven PCF for density. And when you start when you start seeing that things that are real low density materials, uh, they can cause problems, particularly upon wetting. So again, if you have something in the foundation it's like it's been dry, and now we're adding a reservoir to that, and we add water, and you get this hydro collapse potential. Again, if it's in your if this something a material like this is in your foundation, you're probably going to want to get rid of it. And you can see just showing here kind of a simplified test where you've got the initial curve and then you add water and then you see a collapse of the sample. So again, that's a key one to, to if you see that in your testing, that's a big issue. Uh, this is just kind of a idealized cross section showing how, you know, you build it, you think it's perfect looking as a, you know, perfect looking trapezoid, but that embankment, uh, you know, just during construction is going to cause it to spread. You're going to get a little bit of that lateral spreading. Again, it's, it, if it's a well-constructed embankment, you shouldn't see, this shouldn't be significant. This shouldn't be something where you see these big toe bulges on the upstream, downstream toe. But again, it's kind of that idea, this is not just a static uh, section that's going to remain the same even during construction. Uh, rock fill. Um, so well-compacted rock fill can also exhibit compression. There's Again, I think people tend to have a tendency, and myself included, to think some, when you see rock fill put in and you see these massive embankments that are constructed out of rock fill, you just you can't anticipate the fact that it's moving. Uh, but when you're dealing with embankment dams, these huge structures, 300 feet tall, you know, you're still going to see some compression even in a well-compacted rock fill material. Um, there's, there are some outliers where you actually see some really high um, compression within the rock fill. It's probably been poorly compacted probably was placed dry. Uh, you know, water helps things um, kind of move into place during construction. Again, not after construction. Again, these are things we want to think about because we want most of that compression to occur during construction, not after. So design measures. Um, talked a lot about remove and replace. Again, you see in these any of these real big outliers out there, you're going to want to try to remove and replace them. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes you have to think about Again, uh, maybe increasing the thickness of filters and drains and things to account for some of these settlements. Um, and you want to determine during the design phase where you might have these potential cracking. We're doing a lot of risk-informed design now, so you want to look at that and see, okay, is this an area where I might get a potential through-going crack? What can I do in my design to mitigate against that so it doesn't come up as a potential failure mode after construction? 
Um, so this is going to factor into the exercise. So this is the 1% rule for camber. The 1% rule only applies to the embankment portion of it. Um, so typically embankments will, will settle about 1% of the total height long term. So I think if you've got a 300 foot tall embankment, it's probably going to settle about three feet. Um, now, this is for uh, typically smaller dams. For higher risk dams, you know, something that's over 200 feet, um, you're probably going to want to, you're going to actually want to do an analysis to figure out. But my guess is you're probably going to show that that 1% rule is about right. If it doesn't, I'd probably check your analysis maybe a little bit. Um, but you'll probably be in that ballpark. So typically what we'll do is we'll use the 1% rule, say it's about three feet. We'll do some analysis. And if the analysis comes out at 2.8 feet, we're going to assume three feet, right? We're going to be a little bit more conservative and say, we're just going to use three feet going forward. Um, so when you do this 1% um, estimate, we're going to go through a typical process where we're going to round our calculations to the nearest half a foot or even better, the lift thickness. Um, so if you estimate that you're going to get, say, 1.2 feet of total settlement, you probably don't want to do your camber at 1.2 feet because, again, you're doing half a lift or something at the top of that dam, and it's a little bit easier just to make it. And when you consider the cost of adding camber to a dam to the cost that settlement problems can have, it's worth it to go a little bit higher. No one's ever going to complain if you're dam. I shouldn't say no one. The owner or whoever's paying for it might complain. But um, but typically, having a little bit extra freeboard's not going to be a problem. Uh, so here, this is actually the camber design for uh, Isabella. And what you'll notice here, and what's really important to look at, is all the zones have camber in them. It's not just the top of the dam. So the the core, the filters, everything needs to be raised by that amount. Because the idea is. Long term, these are all going to settle down to their design elevations, hopefully a little bit higher. Hopefully you have a little bit of factor of safety built in there. So notice that um, the core itself is increased um, and all the filters and drains are increased as well. Um, and also notice that the you have to steepen up the slopes a little bit as you get closer to the top here. And that makes sense, right? Because if you just if you if you extended this slope the same slope all the way up, your crest is now going to be narrower than the design. So you got to steepen it up a little bit there. And the same thing applies to all these different zones. The other thing to note on here is we've got the table over here showing the different uh, stations and the camber amount. So it's hard to see, but it, it ramps up from the abutment. This is, I want to say the right abutment. It ramps up and then it hits a constant level. And essentially through the valley section, it's the same level all the way across there. So what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to figure out your maximum settlement that you're going to see in that embankment and essentially run that across the whole embankment. Again, the cost of doing an extra lift or two as compared to the issues that you could have. And you don't want to have this crest that you're building up and down and up and down and up and down, right? You want them to be able to go across at a single level. Um, and then it ramps back down over here to the left abutment. And it'll show the profile. Oops. Show the profile right here. So you can see ramps up here from the right abutment up to this mark. And like I said, the, the theoretical settlement across here could have varied quite a bit, but there's probably somewhere in here where, oh, yep, we need that, that amount of camber. And so we're just gonna run that straight across the valley section and then ramp down to the abutments. Uh, rock foundations. So the key to rock foundations is, again, do not ignore the settlement. There's joints, apertures you have to think about. There's infilled joints that might have in, be infilled with soft material, and you have to account for that. And honestly, they're quite a bit more difficult than soil foundations, which makes a lot of sense. It's you know uh, typically a non-homogeneous material. It's fractured. Again, you're going to have to really look at your drilling. Um, the other key here, same thing, kind of talked about earlier with the investigations. You want to extend these settlement analyses about 1.5 to two times the dam height down into the foundation. Again, if you look at a Buzanes pressure distribution, that's where the pressure from the dam starts to kind of taper off to a point where you're going to get a lot less settlement. But you do want to consider it sufficiently deep. Sometimes when you're running these analyses, you might be looking at the numbers you're coming up with and being like, man, that's almost infinitesimally small. But but if you look at it over, say, 50 feet, it could be a few more inches of settlement that you're not accounting for. I think Cassie touched on this quite a bit, but 
Um, you really want to look at what rock materials you have in your foundation, and it's particularly if they're highly weathered, soft, sedimentary rock, uh, consolidation and settlement could be a significant issue. Um, these are the key takeaways from the beginning. So I think we're going to roll right into the exercises.